Well, good evening. As you can see on my favourite clock, it's 9pm here in Port Stewart in Northern Ireland. And as promised, every weekday evening I'm reading a chapter from my book Paperboy. Hopefully a bit of nostalgia and a bit of a crack uh, to give us um, some company during these extraordinary times that we're living through. I hope you're staying well and I hope you're staying at home. And tonight I'm going to read chapter six from Paperboy and chapter six is entitled Three Steps to Heaven. Weekends were hard work for a paper boy, so they were. There wasn't just the gauntlet of Friday nights to be run with the possibility of attacks by wee hoods, hopeful of stealing your takings for the week. On Saturdays, there were heavy additional professional demands too. Saturday night meant two newspapers to be delivered and so doubled the weekday workload. There was Ireland's Saturday night, as well as that day's edition of the Belfast Telegraph. The former was very popular in the Upper Shankill, even though it had Ireland in the title. Of course, you weren't supposed to like anything with Ireland in the title, although the Church of Ireland seemed to be all right for some people. I remember all, us all having to cheer very quietly the night Dana, who said she was from Derry instead of London Derry, won the Eurovision Song Contest for Ireland. If Mrs Piper up our street had heard us cheering because of all kinds of everything, getting dues point from Norway, she might very well have suspected that we were secret IRA supporters and we would have ended up by getting a friendly call from Trevor's da. Anyway, for some strange reason, strange reason Ireland's Saturday night was known to everyone as the Ulster. In my younger days, I had thought that the Shankle was Ulster. Later I realised that the Shankill was in Ulster. Then in geography class one day I noticed on the map that Ulster was in Ireland. Finally I learned that although Ulster was not actually in Britain, it was in fact more British than Britain itself. It all made perfect sense. The Ulster newspaper was simple too. It was a straightforward weekly sports paper paper with all the day sporting results. Published on a Saturday evening to catch all the latest sports results from matches and races that had taken place earlier in the day. It was a true hot off the presses newspaper. You felt special delivering the Ulster because people were standing in the street waiting for it. You were a very important person because you were the courier of extremely valuable information. You had something fresh and precious, something everyone wanted to know. With the Ulster slung over my shoulder, I felt like a scout from a John Wayne movie, returning to the circled wagons to tell his compatriots where the Apaches were. Men who liked football and horses got the Ulster, and they often met me at their front door to take delivery of it. They were like kids getting a birthday card or their 11 plus results. Or like Irene Maxwell getting her Jackie magazine when it had David Cassidy on the front. These customers would start reading the paper straight away, standing up, fully absorbed in its contents, even before the front door was shut again. All of this, however, was a mystery to me. I couldn't imagine a more boring newspaper, apart from that, pink English newspaper with all the numbers in it, which nobody up our way got. I myself preferred to read about Space 1999 and the Tomorrow People in Look In magazine. Science fiction was so much more exciting than football and it seemed to cause less trouble, even though there was usually a higher body count. Unlike with football, Protestants and Catholics seemed to like the same science fiction programmes. No one ever rioted after an episode of Lost in Space, even when Dr Zachary Smith had endangered the life of Will Robinson and his family yet again. I had 16 ulsters to dispatch on a Saturday evening. This wasn't very many, relatively speaking, but though it didn't take long to deliver them, it didn't tend to mess up my social life if I was planning to meet Sharon Burgess at the Westie Disco on a Saturday night. We'll take a wee break there to see who's joined me. So um, let me just scroll down. Hello, uh, hello, uh, Alan. Hi, Naba. Good to have you joining me from Uganda. 
The lovely Leslie, great to have you, of course. Hi, Ian Parsley, good to have you. Hello, Linda, how are you? Kelly from Pennsylvania. Hello, Hazel. Um, oh, hi, Hannah Jemison. Uh, that's great to have you along. Um, Gary Lemonstone. Hello, Mona. Hello, uh, Richard. Uh, let me see who else is here. Hi, Neve. Hi, Nigel. And then if I miss someone up the top there, I don't think that's... Uh, let me just check. I don't want to miss... Some people were asking me to say hello last week and I missed them. No, I haven't missed anyone for now. Good. Okay. Well, I'll keep going. So the Westie Disco was so called because it was a disco that was held in a hut on the corner of the West Circular Road. It was an old nissen hut from the war, which was used by Ballygamartin Presbyterian Church as a church hall, fallen down and freezing though it was. It went, I went to our well-ordered scouts meeting there when the lights were on, but on a Saturday night, the hut was transformed and the lights were switched off and replaced by flashing coloured spotlights and ultraviolet tubes that made your white socks and dandruff glow in the dark. I always made sure to wash my hair with head and shoulders before a night out at the Westy Disco because there was nothing as humiliating as we girls laughing at your fluorescent dandruff as you tried to do a manly dance to status quo. Every Saturday night, all of us teenagers crammed into that aging nissen hut as the corrugated iron walls vibrated to the sounds of the latest hits from Sweet and the Glitter Band. The floor was sticky with chewing gum and slippy with condensation, but we managed to make our moves anyway. The slush, the twist, the bump and the hucklebuck. We had to because this was our only dance floor. The Westy Disco certainly attracted far more kids than Sunday School or the Scouts. Some nights there were more than 400 of us in platforms and parallels, dancing innocently to Shawadi Wadi and the Bay City Rollers, while outside our city convulsed. The Westy Disco was a good place to ask a wee girl you fancied for a slow dance during a Donny Osmond song, so that you could have a go at Snogan. It was here in the dark that I discovered that tongues could have more fun than just blowing bubblegum. Of course, some of the people in the church who never smiled did not approve of such worldly discos. They said that dancing was a sin because it was like sex. It surprised me that sex was a sin. Even people did it because they had lots of been adopted. independently minded minister allowed us to dance because as he said it kept us off the dangerous streets and out of the pubs and the paramilitary organizations on several occasions been spotted ordering paramilitaries off the dangerous streets into the pubs about the lesser of two evils i however ordinary member of the westy disco i was in a very privileged position my parents were voluntary youth leaders for youth gathering in the whole of the Shankle. This made me special. It was like being one of Paul and Linda McCartney's children. My parents had started the disc and Auntie Emma from our street. They weren't my real aunt and uncle, but they were warm people and just like family to us. Uncle Henry did the door where we paid our 10p and where we blew into the breathalyzer to get in. My mother and Auntie Emma, who were best friends and like mommies to the whole hut, did the tuck shop where you could get crisps and chewing gum and peas and vinegar. Auntie Emma never missed a Saturday night, even though she didn't like the disco lights because the ultraviolet rays made her prematurely false teeth look black. Uncle Henry was the warm heart at the Westie, but it was my father who was the star. Daddy was the DJ, like Jimmy Savile on top of the Pops, only younger. He played the 45s on a double deck turntable, plugged into enormous speakers and would turn up the music so loud that the neighbours would complain. This was very cool, of course. Not many dads up our way got accused of blurring out the Bay City Rollers too loud. As resident DJ at the Westie, my father picked the hits and read out the request, so he did. With the profits from the tuck shop, he would buy two new singles every week from the record store. 
They were the latest new releases and they would be his top 40 predictions. He always managed to choose the songs that went to number one. My father was an unlikely candidate for youth club leader in the church because he wasn't good living at all. He smoked and drank and said God didn't exist because Christians didn't practice what they preach. I wasn't so sure this followed because paper boys often didn't do what they were commanded to do either, but Isle Mac certainly still existed. For a middle-aged man, Da's musical choices were very good, although he did get a little too excited by some of the more irritating Boney M singles. One of them was called Belfast. It was a bouncy little sing-along pop song about our hatred for one another in our city. We danced and sang along to it as if it was about something happy and funny, like Waterloo. I put my position as son of the DJ to good uses, slipping in extra requests for my latest singles and asking my dad to play slow songs by Donny Osmond at just the right moment when Sharon Burgess might be most receptive. One of the best slow songs that often elicited a snog from your girl was Three Steps to Heaven by Shawadi Wadi. The lyrics were brilliant. They gave you an easy to remember step-by-step -step guide get to getting yourself a girl. Shawadi Wadi were geniuses. Unfortunately, Mrs. Piper disagreed and when she heard this song blurring out while passing hot on the way to her prayer meeting one night, she complained to my father for leading us all to pray with the devil's music. She said that there was only one true step to heaven and that was for us all to get saved. My DJ da told her to catch herself on. Whatever Mrs. Piper thought, I followed Shawadi Wadi's instructions to the letter. And as I travel on, and things do go wrong, they sang. It was as if they knew of my personal travel problems due to all the buses getting hijacked in Belfast. Just call it steps one, two and three, they crooned. And I would listen with an earnest desire to follow these three steps to heaven. So I would. Step one, to find a girl to love. Sharon Burgess, of course. Step two. She falls in love with you. Hopefully, if I've splashed enough brute all over. Step three, you kiss and hold her tightly. Yes, a proper snog, like the one big ruby at the caravan had shown me. That sure feels like heaven to me. The night at the Westy Disco always ended with The Last Waltz by Engelbert Humperdinck. When the first bars of the piano commenced, we knew it was time for a fish supper and perhaps the opportunity to walk a girl home. Engelbert certainly cleared the floor because the last waltz was old fashioned compared to the latest number from the Rue Betts. But I knew this tune also had a deeper meaning. It was my parents' favourite song from the stereogram in the sitting room and the one to which they had danced when they won the ballroom dancing competition at Butlins in Mosney the year before. So Da played it every week, not just to let us all know that the disco was over, but also to let my mother know that he loved her. In terms of paper delivery, the mountain had to go to Muhammad on a Saturday evening. Iron Mac didn't deliver the ulsters to the streets in the legendary yellow van, as was his wont on weeknights. He had clearly carried out a cost-benefit analysis. The executive summary of this time and motion study was communicated to us in no uncertain terms. You just come and get the ulsters yourselves, you lazy wee buggers, he advised. So on Saturdays, I had to walk to Iron Mac's shop down at the bottom of the Ballygamartin Road. This was more of a nuisance than a heavy burden until one Saturday night when something happened which would henceforth give my favourite Shawadi Wadi song a whole new meaning. Before I tell you that story, I'll say hello to some people. Hello Sadie Hannah, I'm glad you're listening in again. Um, hi Stephanie Houston, lovely to have you. Hi Anne Kirk, hello Marie Hall from Wasaga Beach, fantastic. <laughs> Hello, Andy McCauley. It's good to see all the McCauleys around the world tuning into this. Uh, hi, Geraldine Williams. Hello, Gillian. Oh, hi, Tom. Tom 
uh, Murray Usher, one of the stars of the Paperboy musical for the last couple of years. Good to have you. Um, hello, uh, Shirley. Glad you're enjoying it. Hi, Emer, another star of, uh, yeah, who played the lovely Sharon Burgess this year in the Paperboy music at the Lyric Theatre. Uh, hello, Parik. Hi, Parik Toomey. Good to see you. Hi, Paul Grudgings, old schoolmate. Hello, Ian and Alan and uh, Steve. Great to have you all along. So I'm going to continue the story about that fateful night when I was delivering the Ulsters. One night, as I was delivering the Ulsters, I became aware of two men walking close behind me. I glance around. One of them looks like the lead singer in Shawadi Wadi, your man with the dark glasses. The other, smaller one, has an aggressive mouth like a dog that bites paper boys, and he looks like he's had too many fish suppers. They're both staring at me in an unmistakable, hard man way. I'm outnumbered, so I don't even dare to venture a, who you think you're looking at? Robbers, I conclude in a tense instant, although these guys are in their twenties, older than the usual robbers. Their pace is now quickened, as if they're trying to catch up with me. I quickly turn off the main Balgomartin Road to escape into an empty street and up the hill towards home. Safety always seems to be hillwards in these parts. The two men follow. In my mind, all I can hear is the robot in Lost in Space repeating, Danger Will Robinson! Danger Will Robinson! Danger Will Robinson! Catching up, my pursuers bundle me into the small untidy garden at number four. His owners are never in, but he always get a radio times. I always read it in the street when Doctor Who was on the cover. The Shawadi Wadi guy presses something hard and cold into my back through my duffel coat. Danger, Will Robinson! Danger, Will Robinson! I hear metal clicks against my toggles as I struggle and turn to get loose. I bite on my grammar school scarf. I don't have any money, I cry, my newly broken voice returning to prepubescent shrillness. That's hard to say. I'm telling the truth. My boots are empty. Instinctively, I then turn out my pockets. There is no money, just the remains of a melting white sweetie mouse encrusting a bullseye marble. My assailants don't seem interested. They don't speak. I freeze. I don't understand. There I are, a man after an easy target. I fret inwardly. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger, Will Robinson. It starts to rain very heavily. Icy drops dilute the warm tears in my shivering cheeks. Suddenly, Mr. Watson with the dyed black comb over from number 24, whose wife gets woman and he always gives a big tip at Easter, comes running down the street towards us. My oppressors see him coming and mistakenly sense an attempted rescue. The tough guys just run off, but Mr. Watson is just running to escape the drowned pour of heel. I stand alone in the trampled weeds of the garden of number four beside a small gnome with a fishing rod and his nose broken off. Mr. Watson runs straight past me. He has tonight's Belfast Telegraph over his head to protect his much too black brill creamed hair. I must run home. But then I remember, no one's at home. I must run to the Westy Disco where Dad will be playing Mamma Mia and Mum will be clipping Geordie Cooper around the ear for stealing penny chews as per usual. I must tell them what has just happened. I can't catch a breath. I can't speak. They had put a gun in my back. I start to hyperventilate. I thought only Americans hyperventilated. I burst into the Westy Disco before Uncle Henry can even breathalyze me. A group of adults and wee girls around surround me at the, at the tuck shop. I'm crying. Then I'm embarrassed. What if Sharon Burgess sees me like this? The mood of the tuck shop crowd surrounding me changes from concern to shock and then to outrage. Meanwhile, Geordie Cooper empties the penny chew jar behind them all. The general consensus is that the IRA has tried to kill me. Them fucking provos have just tried to pick off an wee prod tonight, shouts Philip Ferris insensitively. The rumour spreads across the dance floor that paper boys are now legitimate targets. Then I notice the muffled sound of Shawadi Wadi from the loudspeakers in the background. It's three steps to heaven. The lyrics mock me. I feel as if I've just taken several steps closer to heaven than I had ever wanted to. Within 24 hours, I am in Tennant Street Police Station with my father, 
and a serious looking young policeman with a moustache called Darren. All the RUC men have moustaches and many of them are called Darren. I feel more unsafe inside the RUC station than when I was cornered in a garden by the Shawadiwadi guy because the provost kept attacking the Tennant Street station with mortar bombs. And even though the building is surrounded by concrete and fencing nearly as tall as a peace wall, the mortars always get through. I pray the provost haven't planned an attack while I'm giving my statement. Constable Darren shows me black and white pictures of hard men, the way they do in Starsky and Hutch, except these guys are all white. None of them looks like the Shawadiwadi guy, and they all look like the same to me. Scowling faces, long hair and sideburns like Elvis. I conclude that all criminals have sideburns in the same way that all policemen have moustaches and that this distinctive use of facial hair is why they find it so easy to avoid one another. I point to the one who looks most like my attacker. No, he's in the mayor's son, says Darren the policeman. Then he asks me if they touched me anywhere. I don't understand the question. They stuck a gun in my back. What could be worse than that? As we leave the RUC station, my father tells me that if I should ever set eyes on those two again, I must tell him right away and that he would take care of the bastards. I can foresee another outing for the pickaxe handle, but I'm not so sure it would do the job this time. So who's, who's talking with me now? Hello, Joanne. Nice to have you. And Sky. Ah, oh, good to have you, Sky. Another member of the Paperboy cast. Hello, Ali B and Pete Sapura. Hi, Celine. And Phil Derp from Dariaki. Oh, hello, Brian Anderson. Good to have you. So, a few months later, after this, I was waiting on the Ballygamartin Road for the number 73 bus across the town. It was a slippy Saturday morning. The number 73 said Maloon on the front when it, on its way into town and Spring Martin via Shankle on the way back. I liked the idea of being on the bus to Posh Malone, where my orthodontist lived. But I wondered what the people from over there thought about having to get a rough spring, Mar spring Martin bus into town, but perhaps they didn't get the bus. I was carrying my violin case this time instead of my dirty paper bag. My fingertips were sore from last minute practice. I had string and printed fingers and coin embossed toes. I was on my way to the School of Music for orchestra practice, the only boy from this neck of the woods to go there. I had decided never to reveal to the other second violins that I was a Shankal paper boy. Most of them were Catholic grammar school girls and I fancied one of them, a dark haired girl with a cello and an Irish name I couldn't spell. But I knew the rules. I was the wrong sort from the wrong kind of place. So I settled for a distant admiration of her vibrato. Of course, I didn't tell the other paper boys about the school of music either. I knew the combination of mixing with Fenians and playing poofy classical music would attract double derision from them. The bus was late. I wondered if it had been hijacked, but it was a bit early in the day for hijackers. Then, from across the deserted misty road, an old Ford Cortina pulled up abruptly in front of me. It was the Shawadiwadi guy with the gun. He just sat and stared at me. Danger, Will Robinson, danger, Will Robinson. Old Mrs. McCready from number 25, who always got the Sunday Post, arrived beside me at the bus stop, rummaging through her old lady shoppy trolley, shopping trolley bag. She didn't even notice your man. He continued to just sit and stare at me. I wondered what he was going to do this time. I was a teenager now with a broken voice and getting taller. I still wasn't a fighter, but I had by now learned a fairly effective hard man stir that worked with some of the rugby playing bullies in school. I wasn't sure if it worked with big lads with guns though, but I attempted to stir back convincingly. It is possible that carrying a violin undermined the hard man stir, but then again, gangsters in old black and white movies always looked quite threatening when they were carrying violin cases, though of course they didn't wear duffel coats and grammar school scarves. After what seemed like an endless five minutes, the Shawadiwadi guy simply sneered and drove off, giving me a I know where you live kind of stir. However, even though I thought about him often after that, 
I never saw him again. The number 73 eventually arrived and I dinged my ticket and sat down with my violin case on my knee, shaking a little. I could hear my bow rattling inside. I wasn't going to tell my father. I didn't want him to take care of your mom because that would mean someone would then, then take care of my dad. That's how it worked in Belfast. We were going nowhere. The tit for tat mindset reigned supreme. As we travelled down the Shankill Road, the bus driver turned up the wireless. It was Big T on Downtown Radio. He was always on Downtown on Saturday mornings when you were having an Ulster Fry. He was playing Shawadi Wadi. They were singing Three Steps to Heaven. I shivered, so I did. So that's chapter six of Paperboy. Hope you enjoyed that. Hi, hello, Carrie Montgomery. Oh, you missed the bedtime story over the weekend. Hope this helps to put you to sleep tonight. <laughs> hello. Oh, hello, Levixon, my amazing uh, pop star, gospel star from Uganda. Good to have you. Uh, hello, Greta in Norway. Uh, I'm really glad you've all been able to tune in this evening for another uh, chapter of Paperboy. And I'll be back tomorrow night at the same time to do it all over again. So until then, stay well, stay home, and uh, I'll see you soon. Bye for now.